Uh, let's do this this morning. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we'll have you raise your hand. We'd be glad to give you one. If you do have a Bible with you, would you take it out? Let's be in God's Word together. We're in the second half of your Bible today. Uh, we're in the Gospel according to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You can find it right there. Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be. And then uh, Darren already mentioned this, but uh, we do a lot of stuff with our app And if you go there uh, right now, you can find the app and uh, just go ahead and log into that and find Sunday and notes and you can find everything that will be on the screen uh, today will be there as well. And so I just want us to uh, begin by understanding this idea of God's stewards. God's stewards. What is a steward? That's our series. God's stewards. That's that's us. That's who God has made us to be. Not always are we good stewards, but God wants to help us to be his good stewards. And so let's look at a definition for steward. Here it is uh, from the dictionary. A person employed to manage another's property, especially a large house or estate, meaning that you don't just get a little bit to manage. You've been given a great responsibility. In fact, uh, that is the biblical definition is that there would be a servant placed over a large estate or house. You, you have charge of everything. Everything is under your, your uh, disposal to take care of. Here's a second way to say it. It's simply a person whose responsibility it is to take care of something. This belongs to me. I entrust it to you. Please take care of it. I don't know if you've ever been entrusted with something uh, just to say, this is now yours to take care of. Actually, it belongs to me still, but it's yours to take care of. Uh, Use it well. Use it well. I can think of one of the things that when I was a kid and my dad gave me my first pocket knife and he was like, listen, listen. You know, when the dad says that, listen. Use this wisely, which I absolutely did and immediately had uh, a major cut uh, into the finger and said, Dad, I'm going to need your help with this. And he's like, "Mm, that's not what I was talking about. Let's talk about stewarding, handling somebody else's property wisely. And I want to give us a foundational understanding. This is just for all of us to, to understand what we're talking about when we talk about being a good steward from the Bible. Here it is. Three things to understand. Number one is this, that Christ created everything. You cannot read your Bible with, and get away from that. Christ created everything. He created it all. Everything you see and touch and smell, everything in this world, in this universe, the Bible declares he is the creator. He's the designer. He's the one who put it into motion. Number two goes along with that. He owns everything. Everything belongs to him. Now, there are some who follow deism. Deism means that God created everything and he kind of just rejected it and said, ah, I'm not interested anymore. And he's off doing something else. That's deism. That is not a biblical understanding. Christ created everything. Christ owns everything. And then number three is this. Christ delegates responsibility. It all still belongs to him. He created it. It still belongs to him. He owns it. But he entrusts responsibility. I love that word, entrust. I trust you to use this for my glory, God speaking there, for my glory and our good, your good. Use what I give to you for my glory and your good. Christ delegates responsibility. He entrusts us. He said, I don't even trust myself. The Lord has great wisdom and he is saying, I can help you. I'm not asking you to do this alone. I'm not asking you to do this without me. I'm not asking that of you, but I am entrusting this to you and I will help you be a good and godly steward. Now today we're going to look at a passage, Luke 19, and we're going to see somebody who did not begin as a good steward, in fact began with poor stewardship. They were not a good steward, they were not good with what God gave to them, they were not good with it, and they will be changed by Jesus. And in fact, I I want you to read this with me, Uh, verses 1 through 10, you're going to hear about a wee little man A wee little man was he. His name is Zacchaeus. And so look at verse 1 as we read about Jesus encountering this man named Zacchaeus. Here it is, verse 1. He, that is Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. He has no intention to stop there, but he's passing through intentionally. 
And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. That's his job. That's his role. That's his status. That's his identity. And here's another part of his identity and was rich. He was very wealthy. He was very rich because of his role as a chief tax collector. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. He was not very tall. And if you've ever been to a parade, you've been there and you might be a couple of rows deep trying to see what's happening in the parade. If you're not very tall, you're going to miss the whole parade's going to go by and you're not going to see it. That's what would have happened for Zacchaeus. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, that is the crowd, saw it, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in. They're complaining about Jesus. Their complaint is with Jesus. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to, to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything which he has, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today. Salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. Then watch this last verse. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's stop right there. Let's be reminded that, that we're not reading a nice story, that this is an account, a historical, literal account of Jesus meeting Zacchaeus, a real man in a real place, Jericho, the city, and what we hold in our hands, what we're going to interact with right now, this is God's word for us. Amen? And that's an understanding. We're not just coming together and to say, well, those are some nice words, and that was a nice story, don't you think? This is a real account of Jesus meeting somebody who is a poor steward and needs to be changed into a godly steward, somebody who handles what has been entrusted to him. And so we begin this way. This passage is uh, situated on the heels of a couple different encounters where people with very different wealth, uh, income, uh, what they have to their name, on the spectrum, it's very different. You're going to see that Luke is intentionally showing you the, this is how the order went, but also that these three accounts, and I'm going to tell you of the two other accounts that precede Zacchaeus, you'll understand what happens in Zacchaeus' heart and life better when you understand the process of what's happening here. We are people here at Harvest who love to read text in context. What gets people into trouble is when they take something out of the Bible and they just rip a little piece out and they wave it around and they say, see, 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 and they don't understand well, how does that fit into the greater story? What was going on there? And that happens all the time in our world. We see it in the soundbite world. There was a 30-minute interview, and what got played on the radio, what got played uh, across Instagram was a three-second or a 30-second of a 30-minute interview. And things can be misunderstood very easily. And so I want you to understand Zacchaeus and his encounter with Jesus as it fits into what has been happening as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 18, you could turn back uh, just a few pages and see that there is an account where Jesus meets a young man of great wealth, a, a, man, a young man who has status and power and influence. In fact, you might have a heading in your Bible above verse 18 that says the rich ruler, the rich ruler, that, that he was decidedly somebody who had power, but he was somebody decidedly who had power, who had much in the area of wealth and influence. And so Jesus is approached by this wealthy young man who wanted to know, and this is a great question, he wanted to know how he could have eternal life. The individual had insisted that he had lived a good life. 
that he had been good. In essence, he believed that he, he was wealthy in spiritual things. The rich, young ruler believed he had it together in the area of spirituality, except that he knew something was missing. He knew something was missing. That's why he came to Jesus in this way. And uh, he really did come to Jesus and claimed that he had kept all of the law up to that point, implying that Jesus should accept him because of what he has and what he's done. And he's a good person. By the way, this is how a lot of us lead when we think about Jesus. We say, look at my resume. I've, I've done a lot of good things, better than that person and better than that person and better than that person. And we, we show Jesus our resume of all the good things we've done. The rich young ruler does that. I've, I've kept all those. What, what else? What else can I add to my list, Jesus? Jesus then issues a generous challenge to him. He said, You still lack one thing. By the way, that is a hard word for somebody who has a lot. It's a hard word for any one of us, actually. You are lacking something. There's something missing. And I'm going to point it out, and that can be very uncomfortable. I'm going to show you what you lack. Here's what he said. Go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. What he was lacking was the relationship with Jesus. What he was lacking was this ability to say, Jesus is my savior. Jesus, I have a relationship with him. Jesus is the one who's worth following. And so in this way, Jesus is showing him very clearly what he lacks. He said, just go sell everything else and come and follow me. The same words he said to Peter and James and John, the, the disciples, the same words he would say to you and I today. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, Jesus is inviting you to say, come, follow me. He says it to this young man. And what we see, the scripture tells us there in Luke 18, the man went away sad because he was extremely wealthy. He was was more upset about giving away what he had instead of joyfully receiving what Jesus offered to him. He got it backwards. Instead of receiving what Jesus offered to him and saying the other stuff doesn't matter. The other stuff stuff can come and go. Jesus uses this example and says, it is hard for wealthy people to enter the kingdom of God. And we have to ask why. Why is it hard for wealthy people to enter the kingdom of God? We, just as humans, people all over the world, we put our trust in our wealth and our kingdom and what we have accomplished and what we do. That's just what, that comes to us naturally. We put our wealth in our wealth. We put our wealth in our achievement. We put our wealth in our kingdom. We put our trust in all those things. But here's the good news. Jesus follows it up and said, but nothing is impossible with God. It doesn't matter whether you have a lot or you have a little. Nothing is impossible for God. Can wealthy people come to know Jesus? Absolutely, yes. Can people who have very little wealth come to know Jesus? Absolutely, yes. And Jesus is offering that invitation. Come And follow me. Now there's another encounter that happens just ahead of Jesus meeting Zacchaeus. And that is found in Luke chapter 18 verse 35. And is the other end of the wealth spectrum. We had this rich ruler who believed he was wealthy in spiritual things and wealthy in finance. And we find out that he is a poor steward. We find out that he is a poor steward. He does not take Jesus' invitation to come and follow him. Money got in the way. The next encounter is Jesus going down the road, approaching the city of Jericho, and a blind beggar. That this this is this is another level of begging. If this man doesn't have somebody give him some food that day, he doesn't eat. He is blind, he cannot see. And every day he goes out and asks people to help him. Would you help me? Would you, would you give me something to eat? Would you give me uh, something to drink? Would you give me some money so that I could get some food? Would you help me? Every day, here's this blind beggar. He's not just a panhandler. 
who has a business proposition. This is somebody who is in legitimate need. This man is blind and he he is begging every day, but there's nothing wrong with his hearing. I think that's interesting. He has heard that Jesus is going to be passing by. And he has heard, again, nothing wrong with his hearing, that Jesus has healed person after person after person. The word has spread about Jesus. And I love this about Jesus. There's nothing, you read the Gospels, there's nothing that is brought to him. There's no ailment, there's no, there's no sickness, there's no problem that Jesus cannot heal. Even today, if you go to the doctor, you might come and say, hey, what do you think it is? And we're not sure what it is. We're going to have to do some more tests. And we're not sure what's going on here. You've been a little bit of a mystery to us. Jesus said, I got you. I can handle that. There's nothing that Jesus could not heal. That is, that is amazing. That's good news. We need Jesus, the healer, in our world to be showing up on a regular basis. And so here is Jesus passing by. And this blind beggar hears that he's passing by and begins to shout. He begins to call out and ask Jesus to come and give him his sight. And he begins to shout. I I just wrote down there just kind of a, a funny thing that's going on. People tried to shush this beggar like, quiet, quiet, quiet. He only got louder. And it's like this, can't you see that he's busy? No, I can't. And it just gets louder. Jesus, son of David, I want my sight. And Jesus stops the procession, heals the man, demonstrate that he is the true king, the son of David. He is the rightful king and he has the power to back it up. It's one thing to have the words to say, I'm the rightful king. It's another one to be able to prove you're the rightful king. And Jesus proves it and proves it and proves it. What happens to the blind man? He jumps into the procession and carries on with Jesus. Now, Jesus enters Jericho as he is passing through. We have to ask, why is he, it seems like there's a pace, a a very quick pace. Jesus is determined. Where is he going? He's going to Jerusalem. If you read further, he's on his way to Jerusalem. One of the next things that will happen is the triumphal entry where he rides into Jerusalem on the colt, the full of a donkey. He is announced as the king and very shortly thereafter, he will be escorted out of the city because he is betrayed and he will be hung on a cross. Jesus isn't running away. He's running to the cross, marching to the cross, determined to go there. And I want to just show you Jericho here, the the map. Some people uh, say, is that a real place? Is this the place where the walls fell down as you read about Joshua and how the people of Israel circled the city of Jericho? Yes and no. Yes and no. The city of Jericho that you read about in the Old Testament, the walls were destroyed and the city was uh, laid barren for years and years and years. But then it was rebuilt. And this is this is like uh, Jericho 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0 at this point, because hundreds of years have passed. But it is very near that Jericho and people are living there, one of which is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, uh, as you notice, he is not a godly steward. Jesus, I want you to think about this. We have the comparison. Jesus, very generous in how he invites this rich young ruler to come and follow him. Jesus, very generous in how he says to the blind beggar, you want your sight? I can do that. Very generous. And then there's Zacchaeus, contrasted, that he lives every day on the take. Every day on the take. He is not about giving, he is about taking. And so we must see Jesus, the Savior, accurately in this passage. I'm going to give you a couple of things to write down about godly stewardship today, because it's meant to touch our lives. Let's begin here. Number one, godly stewardship begins with Jesus. It makes sense. If Christ creates everything and he owns everything and he delegates responsibility, we should see that godly stewardship begins with Jesus. And generosity here is only 
in our world because we have a generous Savior. I love that, that even as a part of the five each week, we talk about, hey, be generous because Jesus is generous. Be generous because Jesus is generous. And we can see that all throughout the scripture. We really have nothing to give if we have not already received from the Savior. That brings us to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is, uh, is a lot like the rich young ruler. By the way, these three are meant to be compared. They're, they're together in this account. You are meant to compare them. Zacchaeus, like the rich young ruler, was very wealthy. The young, rich young ruler, Luke 18, very wealthy. Zacchaeus, very clearly, Luke tells you he was rich. And how did he gain his wealth? He was a chief tax collector. He is rich, he is powerful, but then it tells us one other little uh, side note that he is small in stature. He is not a tall man. I don't know what you picture him, but I picture him kind of like this. A little bit of Napoleon going on. Maybe he had the hat. Uh, We don't know for sure, but that's kind of how I picture Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, though, is Jewish, and he is employed, his employer is the Roman government, the occupying force, the hated occupying force in this part of the world. And Rome, they didn't just tax, tax people so they could improve roads. Yes, that's part of it. Yes, the Roman roads, that's part of it. But they also subjected people to heavy and burdensome taxation in order to control them, also to fuel their, their campaigns, their military campaigns, so they could expand the kingdom and tax more people and you only get the funds for doing that by taxing the empire you already have. So the people are not fans of Rome and Zacchaeus is a lightning rod because he represents all that Rome stands for and yet he's not Roman, he's Jewish. Zacchaeus, a powerful man, a politically connected man, a man who is very rich but came by his riches in ways that are not generous and don't look like Jesus. He's on the take. He's not a good steward, and some would say he's a thief. But the buzz about Jesus has reached the ears of Zacchaeus, not just the blind man. The buzz about Jesus coming that way, he wants to see Jesus for himself. So think about this. Zacchaeus is like the rich young ruler in that he's very wealthy, but he's unfulfilled. And he's also like the blind man because he has a vision problem. He wants to see Jesus, but he's not going to be able to see Jesus because of his stature and because of the crowds. And so he, he comes up with a plan the, the blind man just shouted louder. Zacchaeus, instead of shouting louder, runs ahead, climbs the sycamore tree. If you know that little children's song, you will remember that he's a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And he climbed up in that sycamore tree. I love that it even names that little detail. Sycamores grow great in this valley. That arid climate, they do well there in that part of the world. They do well here. And so Up the tree he went. And Jesus, as he was coming down the road, stops in that place. And it says he looked up. Zacchaeus, he said, you come down. Hurry. Come on. Hurry. Come down. For I'm going to your house today. Did you notice this? He called Zacchaeus by name. He called him by name. I'm sure that very few people around Zacchaeus' town and area called him by his real name. I'm sure they called him lots of names. Would you agree? You're like, I, have, I, would, I had some names for him. I would have some names for him. None of them would be his legitimate name. But Jesus knows his name, and he said, come down, hurry and come down. I'm going to your house today. And I have this question for us. Are you on a first name basis with the Savior? You need to be. You're meant to be. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. And I I love what's happening here. Jericho, 
not the Jericho of old, but walls are falling down around because of what Jesus is doing here. Walls are falling down again in Jericho. Jesus does this wherever he goes. He breaks down walls of discrimination between Jew and Gentile. He'll talk to a woman at a well who is not Jewish. He'll talk to rich and poor. He will break down walls of discrimination. Jesus will break down walls of pride. And now he's going to break down some walls that are surrounding poor stewardship. This mishandling of what God has given. And here he comes. He says this, Zacchaeus, I know who you are. I know what you've done. I know your name. And I'm still willing to come to your house. Would you write this down? Number two, godly stewardship will always have critics. Godly stewardship will always have critics. If number one is this, godly stewardship begins with Jesus. Did you notice who they criticized in this this account? It was Jesus. I can't believe he would go to the house of a sinner. Doesn't he have any standards? His standards are very clearly stated in verse 10. Did you notice that? Jesus said it this way. For the Son of Man came. You know why I'm here? I came to seek and to save the lost. You're either in one of two camps regarding Jesus. You're either in the lost camp and we all begin there. Or you're in the found camp in relationship where Jesus is calling you by name. And you're calling him by name. And you get to call the Father in heaven, Father. Godly stewardship will always have critics. I love that Jesus took upon himself the grumbling. He didn't say, oh, 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 I probably shouldn't go to your house. It'll look bad. I'm trying to make my way to Jerusalem. I don't want anything to get in the way of that. Jesus just took the grumbling. He took their complaints. He took it on himself. Think about it this way. Jesus found Zacchaeus up in a tree. That's where he found him. But Jesus is saying, you don't know this, but I do, that very soon, not far from here, I will not be found up in a tree, but I will be hung on a tree, placed on a tree. And I will do that, and people will shout, and they will grumble, and they will criticize, and they will demean. They will betray On the tree that Jesus would be hung from, he would take the grumbling and he would take the jeering, he would take the mocking and he would take the weight of our sin for us. He would take it for Zacchaeus. He would take it for the blind beggar. He would take it for you and for me. Jesus is the most generous man who has ever lived in the history of this world. Because he was more than the man. He was the son of David. He's the son of God who came from heaven for us. And I love that he said, Zacchaeus, you hurry and come down from your tree. From your tree. You hurry and come down from that tree because I'm going to your house today. And I I love this. There's a little bit of humor in here that that you just have to recognize. And at least I found it humorous as I read this account. Verse 8. Says this, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, I, I put a little asterisk in my notes here. It probably took people a little while to recognize he was standing. Zacchaeus, stand up. I am. I am. Zacchaeus, go ahead and stand up. People having fun with him. But Zacchaeus stands up and he addresses Jesus directly. Notice this, it's not Jesus addressing Zacchaeus here. It's Zacchaeus addressing Jesus. Jesus has already addressed him by name and said, I want to come to your house. Jesus has already addressed Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus is addressing Jesus and he says this, I will give 50% of all I have to the poor. I'll give half of everything I have to the poor. He is not earning salvation here. He is responding to the love and generosity of Jesus. A poor steward is being transformed in front of our eyes in this passage. I'll give 50% away, many of whom may have become poor in part because of Zacchaeus and his 
theft, his taxation on behalf of Rome. The Old Testament talked about giving, uh, as a starting point, a tithe, a tenth of everything that you have. That's, that's in the Old Testament. We're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks, of what a tithe is and what an offering is, and those things as we understand stewardship together. The Old Testament talked about it that way. Uh, and here's Zacchaeus saying, I'm going to jump to 50%. I'm going to give away half of everything I have to the poor. And then he goes on to say, and I will restore, I will give restitution four times, fourfold, because he has taken. He has taken, and he knows it. Everybody knows it. That's why they would call him a sinner. They wouldn't call him by his name, but they would call him a sinner. Now notice this. Zacchaeus, as he becomes a good and godly steward, Right here, he begins just to, to handle what God has given, now in a God-honoring way. The law required that a penalty of one-fifth be used for restitution, for fraud. Zacchaeus is saying, I'm going I'm to go beyond what's required. I'm going to give four times, four times. The amount that that only place you would see that happen in the Old Testament was in Exodus 22, verse one, that required when an animal was stolen and was killed, that the person would need to replace that animal. If you stole a goat and it was killed, you need to return four goats to that person. That's where you see this. If the animal was found alive, only twofold restitution was required. Here is Zacchaeus is saying, I get the seriousness of my sin. Nobody has to tell me I know. Very honest. Acknowledging that he was guilty uh, on, on, on the level just of a common thief. Here he comes saying, Jesus has changed me. And because he's changed me, things are going to change around me. Would you write this down? Number three about godly stewardship. Godly stewardship flows out. It flows out when the Holy Spirit flows into someone's life. In fact, we would not say, do not try to be a godly steward apart from the Savior. If you don't know Jesus, you have no reason. Zacchaeus, it was the fruit of having a relationship with Jesus, not trying to earn a relationship with Jesus. It is coming out of Zacchaeus saying, Jesus called me by name. Jesus came to my home. Jesus loves me. And nobody loves me like that. Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. I love that Jesus said that. Salvation today, I'm looking in verse nine. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Literally, think about it this way. Jesus is salvation. Salvation walked through the front door and made himself at home. He walked through the front door. Jesus is salvation. And Jesus remarks that Zacchaeus is not only a son of Abraham by heritage. He is truly a son of Abraham because Abraham was known as the father of faith. Abraham is synonymous with somebody who responds in faith. And Zacchaeus has responded like Abraham. What a comparison. To have Jesus compare you to Abraham, everything is changing from somebody who was a poor steward to somebody who is saying, Christ created everything. Everything belongs to him. He owns it all. And he's given and trusted me with the responsibility of handling everything I have in a God-honoring way. I love this. Jesus lays it on the line. I came. I came. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This was not a swap. It wasn't like, hey, if you give half, I'll let you into the kingdom. If you give four times back, I'll let you be in my family. It was not a swap like that. Jesus came into his home and extended his love and brought him out of the category of lost and into the found category. And because of that, then this overflow 
begins to spill out of Zacchaeus' life. Jesus would say it this way, you can never repay me. It just doesn't work that way. The business of Jesus, why he came, is to generously change life after life after life. And that's why he came to Zacchaeus' home, and that's why he wants to make himself at home in your life. He doesn't want to be an outsider. He wants to be referring to you by name and that the Holy Spirit would take up residence in your home as you commit yourself to him. I would, I would give a warning here. Do not try to be God's steward on your own. Do not try to do this on your own. That is not possible. It's not how it works. Generosity begins with Jesus. So today, today we just say, listen, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, accept him. standing at the doorway to your life and saying, hurry, hurry. I'm meant to go to your house today. I'm meant to come into your life today. Jesus will willingly take the grumbling that he's changing you on himself. You don't know them. Well, they don't deserve you. Do you know where they've been? Do you know what they've done? Jesus said, just, just throw that on me. I'll take that. Today, I want to give folks an opportunity to receive Jesus and let the Holy Spirit flow in and say, ah. as the Holy Spirit changes you, then you become God's steward. I'm just lead us in a time of prayer right now. And if you have not put your faith in Jesus right now, right now, hurry. Jesus is knocking. Hurry and come down. I have come to your house today. I'm, I'm ready. Would you join me in praying here? If you have not put your faith in Jesus, today is the day. Just simply, this is a confession for you to say. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I recognize my need. My resume does not cut it with you. It's not enough. It will never be enough. I could not earn your love. And so, Jesus, I come and ask for the free gift of salvation. I pray that you would give that to me. You just pray this, you and the Lord. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I pray that you would come in to my life and be at home take up residence here. I want, I want you to lead and I want to follow after you. I want to be known for you. Holy Spirit, I'm excited about what you're going to do in me and through me. Praise the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen, if you, if you put your faith in Jesus today, We'd like to know. We'd like to celebrate with you. I had somebody talk to me after the first service and said, hey, when can I get baptized? All right. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. You understand who Jesus is. You understand what he's done. And he said, listen, I'm ready to lead. Are you ready to follow? I'm just going to lead us right into a time of worship and celebration. Would you just stand where you're at? And let's celebrate Jesus in this place together.